uniting the racists with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We're also rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. I am Jesse Lee Peterson, who is not an African-American. I am not an African-American. I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. There are no African drums beating in my chest. The American guitar is playing in my heart as black as the ace of spades, but 100% American. Taking your phone calls at 888-77-53773, Jesse, lots of protests going on uh, by black people around the country, and uh, things are in a mess. Bad situation right now. Uh, I have a guest coming up for you in a minute. I don't know the name of the guest yet, so I'm waiting for James. You been smoking, James? Okay. Um, James, you been smoking? (laughs) I have with me um, Samuel Sinyanwe. Uh, he is a policy analyst and data scientist who worked with communities of color to fight systematic racism through cutting-edge policies and strategy. And I wanted to talk to him, and he will take some calls from you as well, uh, about all this stuff going on. Uh, Samuel, good morning, uh, sir, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Sammy, you are black American, right? Yes. Um, and I asked because you look like you could be mixed, either, you know, with white and black or something else. That's why I ask. Uh, you grew up in Orlando, Florida, uh, attended Stanford University in California, studying how race and racism impact the U.S. political system. I wanted to know, how did you get into that? What made you decide to go that route? I mean, for me, it really wasn't a choice. So I grew up in Orlando, Florida, uh, and I attended, you know, for elementary school, I attended a predominantly white school, uh, white Southern Baptist school, and race was just in my face every single day, Um, dealing with some of the kids there, some of the adults, the teachers. Uh, And so really, I have been seeking to understand these forces better. You know, I went off to college really to understand. The Sam, I'm sorry, are you on a speakerphone? Uh, no, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, that's much better. Go ahead. Sure. So I was saying that, you know, from where I grew up uh, in Orlando, Florida, race really was unavoidable. And, you know, what I wanted to do was better understand how race and racism impacts people like me and start to understand what are the solutions to really uh, overcome some of these challenges, really, that, that we face in everyday life uh, and that are really structural in our society. And so that has been the journey that I've been on and has taken me into a- advocacy and activism uh, in order to secure some of the policies we need uh, to protect and value uh, black folks around the country. So growing up in a white school... Give me an example. Give me something that would make you concerned about racism as a kid. I mean, so there were countless incidents. Like, you know, there were times where I had been uh, beaten up uh, and and called the N word, for example, uh, randomly. Uh, there were times when my teacher I felt was uh, singling me out as a troublemaker when other folks, other kids, were doing the same thing. Uh, and so those types of things on a daily basis sort of bring you to the realization that uh, you are not belonging in that environment, uh, and you really start to ask questions as to why. Uh, what's the history behind this, and what are some of the solutions uh, to create a more inclusive America uh, for black folks to really thrive? Um, were you a troublemaker? I got into good trouble. So you were a troublemaker. So I would say that, you know, what I did was uh, constantly think about how do we create uh, new and interesting uh, ways of looking at issues. Uh, And I think, you know, in in certain environments, uh, there is a tendency to have particular social norms and say that there is a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. 
uh, and that there is uh, no tolerance really for folks to deviate from what is considered the norm. Uh, and so that's sort of something that I've experienced, not only growing up, but I think that is something that is endemic in a lot of parts of society. Uh, and I think we need to be pushing the envelope and thinking about new ways of including new types of voices, new perspectives, and new people into the dialogue. So then when the teacher got on you about, about being a troublemaker, it was not because of you being black. It's because you were a troublemaker. And it, never mind your color, because... It is the job of the teacher to punish the kids who create trouble. I would say that's something different. I would say that, uh, you know, being black in America means you have less margin for error. And that means that when all of the other kids are doing the same thing, the teacher will call you out and punish you disproportionately. And that's what we see in the statistics uh, in terms of suspension rates, expulsion rates, re- referral to the principal rates, arrest in, in school rates, uh, all the way up to uh, contact with the uh, criminal justice system and killing by police. Uh, and so, you know, I would say that it is much more complex than that, and race certainly plays a role uh, in who ends up bearing the brunt uh, of that punishment. Is it abnormal for kids in school to get into fights while going through school? Uh, I'm not sure, really. I mean, I think, you know, there may be occasions. What I do know that that seemed abnormal to me uh, you know, I was, I'll was i give you an example. I was six years old uh, at a summer camp uh, and, you know, walked into the bathroom and a kid, a white kid, beat me up uh, and called me the N-word uh, just like that. Uh, and that was something that I held on to for a very long time. And so things like that I don't think are normal. They certainly aren't normal for white kids growing up. We're definitely normal for children of all races while going through school, boys and girls. Some worse than others, of course, but it's normal for kids to fight and and do things going through school. Uh, you went to a white school, so naturally, if there are more white kids there, you're going to have encounters like that with white kids. Had it been more black, dark-skinned kids and light black kids, the light black kid and the black dark black kid would have been fighting in the same way. Boys and girls, especially boys, pick on each other while going through school. It's gonna, it was happening during my time, before my time, and it's going to continue to happen as long as human beings continue to have babies. I mean, obviously kids will be kids, but what I think is different is that there are systems in place to protect uh, the behavior of some kids and, frankly, that are reinforced by some adults. Uh, in society, that's not the case for black kids in America. Um, White you know, kids are about... being picked on by blacks and Hispanics or Mexican kids, and and um, uh, uh, more so than whites are doing it to blacks or Mexican or Hispanic kids. Is it racism for the blacks and the Mexicans to pick on the white kids like that? And what I would say is that, you know, kids will pick on kids. What is different is that what you'll see in the data that is happening nationwide is that, you know, black kids are being suspended and expelled from school, are being referred to law enforcement, are being arrested, are being uh, entered into the criminal justice system at higher rates for doing the same types of behaviors as white kids. And so there's a broader system here than just kids picking on kids. It is that there is a system that, that values and protects uh, white kids more so than it does black kids and sends black kids down the school to prison pipeline. We so all I think that that is more damaging than than sort of uh, you know playground antics. That is has really uh, meaningful effects, long term effects on the well being of our kids. I want to ask you about your organization, but I think you would agree with me, as most people do, that black kids are more violent than other kids, and they tend to pick on whites, Hispanics, and Asians. I want to know a yes or no to the question. Is that racism when black kids are picking on or fighting with white kids in school? Is that racism? So, first of all, I haven't seen the data that you're referring to. And and second of all, I think when we talk about racism, uh, we need to think about racism in a much broader way than just our interpersonal encounters. Racism is the broader system that values and protects certain behaviors, ideas, uh, and types of people over other people. Uh, so, for example, you are not going to have a situation uh, where, 
you know, if a white kid picks on a black kid, that get that that kid would receive uh, time and time again the same level of punishment as a black kid picking on the white kid. So the system they operate in uh, is actually advantaging some kids over others, and that is much more damaging uh, than sort of the interpersonal things that that you are referring to, because they have real consequences in terms of the legal system, in terms of academics, uh, in terms of your trajectory. Uh, as you try to uh, integrate into a sort of the broader uh, economy. You, uh, your, your interpersonal encounters made you angry and motivated you, right? I think what I was able to do was figure out a way uh, to channel uh, that emotion into uh, activism. Uh, and thinking about new and creative ways to uh, tell the truth about the the things that I was experiencing and, and that folks who look like me experience every day. I read that you've done a project called Mapping Police Violence. Were you able to track how many cases in which uh, use of force was justified? Uh, so there is some track. Hold that thought for me, Samuel. Yeah. Let me take a break. We'll come back, and I want you to respond to that. 888-7753-773. Back in a moment. I'm talking to Samuel Sin Yangwe. He is with an organization called Campaign Zero. And Samuel, before the break, we've got to get to your calls, folks, at 888-7753-773. I ask, you've done a project called Mapping Police Violence. And I wanted to know, were you able to track how many cases in which use of force was justified? Yeah, so what you'll find is that the vast majority of uh, uses of deadly force have been ruled justified by uh, the local authorities that have conducted the investigation. You said that I would find reports that says that, right? Yeah. So, you know, ultimately, because this, these numbers are, uh, you know, they are ever evolving in, in the sense of uh, many of these are still pending investigation because our, our data uh, is recent. So it's 2015, uh, 2014, and 2013. Uh-huh. Uh, and many investigations are ongoing. But among those that have concluded, uh, the vast, vast majority, uh, about uh, 90 Seven or 98 percent uh, of police killings, cases where police have killed somebody, uh, the local authorities doing the investigation have ruled those uh, incidents justified. Now, that being said, we have seen this happen in many cases uh, that the average observer would say should not be justified. And so there's a lot to be said about conflicts of interest uh, and the incentives of the local authorities to side with the police over the community. Do you question those rulings? Do you personally question them? Absolutely. I think we've seen a number of cases uh, that, you know, were ruled justified or where police officers not been charged with a crime uh, after an egregious um, breach of justice. So, you know, you think about Eric Garner, for example. Um, you know, Officer Pantaleo was, was not indicted despite, you know, choking... Uh, Eric Garner for selling loose packs of cigarettes uh, while he was on the ground saying, I can't breathe, right? So uh, things like that uh, show that clearly uh, there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of making sure that there is real accountability. in the system. Well, Eric Garner, and I'm sure you agree with this, um, um, was an unhealthy man, and he was resisting arrest, and that's why the charges were not brought down upon the cop, on the police officer, because you can't resist arrest when the police, you're stopped by a policeman. So we both know that there is uh, a progressive uh, tiered use of force matrix that police departments are supposed to follow. And that means that the use of force is supposed to be proportionate to the risk presented. Now, Eric Gardner did not present any sort of a threat or a risk uh, to those police officers, and yet their use of force was essentially deadly force. A chokehold is deadly force. Uh, and so, you know, that is not proportionate uh, and is certainly not in keeping with uh, any sort of approach that values the lives 
uh, of the communities that these police departments are supposed to protect and serve, are paid by the taxpayers to protect and serve. Eric was a big, fat black man, and uh, he was, uh, as you saw in the video, he was pulling his hands away when they were grabbing them, when the officers were grabbing, grabbing his hand, trying to handcuff him. And he didn't die from a choke hole. He died from some other uh, complications that he already had. I mean, that's not what the coroner said. I mean, it was ruled a, a homicide um, due to the police use of force. I mean, certainly that there were a number of other factors, but the fact of the matter is he would be alive today were it not for that uh, unnecessary uh, use of deadly force. Well, you don't know that for sure. The guy can walk around the block without stopping to catch his breath. I mean, so so that means, in, in your view, that the police should be able to use deadly force if you have your hands up uh, and immediately talking uh, uh, about an injustice, which in many ways uh, could be argued that the police should not play that role of arresting people uh, for having loose cigarettes. No, and, but... And so you should not, as a citizen, have the right uh, to, in fact, contest and say that that is not uh, appropriate while you do not present a threat to police officers and, and that you should be killed for that? Well, that first, of all, first, of, first of all, the, the, the report that you mentioned of the uh, coroner was not, it was, uh, we don't know if that was really real or not. But the one thing you need, and I think, Sammy, you, you would agree with me, and I hope that you're teaching the people by way of your organization that when you're stopped by police, you hold your hands up, you follow their instructions, and if they should me- mistreat you when you're following all the rules, then there are a way. There is a way to file a complaint. There uh, are things you can do to punish the officer for doing wrong. But if you are being stopped by the cop, you have a criminal record already, and then you're going to resist arrest, you can't blame the officer for doing his or her job. You do agree with me on that, right? So what I'll say is that, you know, people take their own lives into their hands. I think everybody knows uh, that their lives, particularly as black people in this country, are at risk whenever they interact with a police officer. And in many ways... Um, All people's lives are at risk if they're resisting arrest. And I think that there is a, a widespread knowledge that people, take, that people uh, act in a way to secure their survival in those interactions. Uh, and, but what I but I will also say is that you know what you said around that there are means and systems to actually ensure accountability after the fact. I mean that's just not true. The data shows that that's not true. You look, for example, in Chicago, uh, where all of the officer complaints are now available online, public information by the Invisible Institute. They found 55,000 complaints against officers. Uh, only 44 officers were ever fired. Uh, based on one of those complaints. You have 55,000 people complain, uh, or 55,000 complaints. Some officers receive 48, 60 complaints against them about similar things, uh, and not, and yet they are still on the force today. In fact, one of those officers, um, Jason Van Dyke, was the one. He had about 20 complaints that he killed Laquan McDonald uh, with 16 shots while Laquan, Laquan was already shot and laid on the ground. And so... Uh, you know, I think there there aren't systems that ensure accountability. Part of what Campaign Zero is about is, is putting in place those types of systems yeah, uh, so that there can be that belief that, if in fact, if you do uh, survive that interaction, that there is a means of ensuring justice and accountability for what happened. Well, uh, Sammy, you're black, and I am black, and we, we know how black people think and act. And it's not unusual for black people to complain and lie to try to get what they want, even if it's the wrong way to get it. And so this report that you mentioned about them complaining, I mean, the average American roll their eyes when they hear black complaining. They've been complaining for 50 and 60 years, and uh, for whatever reason, they are refusing to take control of their lives, and I don't know why they think complaining and lying is going to make their lives better. So I'm sure you... As I do, when you hear about these complaints from black people, you just roll your eyes, right? Uh, no, I don't. And I think it is. Uh, it's curious because I, I do not hold the belief, as as you said in, in the, over the course of this interview, that black folks are, are violent, uh, or complain and lie about things that aren't true. I mean, I don't think that's true about our people. I think we are great people. I think we. What's great about you people? 
What's great about you people? Give me something that's I great think about we are you. Resilient. We are resilient and brilliant. I Give think, me that example know, of that, of you being resilient and brilliant. I think about all of the all of the black joy that we see. Folks who are, are dancing are being happy. Dancing? Encountering. Yeah, despite being Anybody happy, can dance. White people dance. Fight. No, but what I'll say is that it's different when you're experiencing Hold on, Samuel. Poverty. Samuel, hold on, okay? Hold on. I'll let you explain. I want, I want an example of black people being brilliant and resilient right after this break. Okay, folks, welcome back. I am Jesse Lee Peterson talking to Samuel San Yang Wei, and he is with an organization called Campaign Zero, a black activist, activist for Campaign um, Zero. And we're going to get to your call in just a minute here. Samuel, let me ask, um, did you disagree with me that um, because I thought, first, I have one other question first. Your father and mother are black? Uh, no, sir. My dad is black and my mother is white. Oh. And so why you why are you going as black instead of mixed? I identify as black. I have identified as black since I've been a kid uh, because that is how I have experienced uh, life. That is how I've been identified as by society, by the systems in which uh, I have grown up, and I remember, you know, being in a second grade and receiving um, my first standardized test scores back, and they labeled my race as black. I had never asked myself what my race was before that, and ever since, I just assumed it was black, and society has confirmed that assumption. What is it on your birth certificate? Uh, I haven't seen my birth certificate, although uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it says black. I'm not sure. Do they actually label your race on the birth certificate? I know they used to. I'm not sure how they do it now. Um, An interesting question. Did you get into Stanford on affirmative action? I mean, I had a near-perfect SAT score. I had a uh, 1570 out of 1600, uh, and I had stellar extracurriculars. Uh, was involved in, uh, you know, had straight A's. In, in an IB program at uh, one of the best schools in, in my area. So uh, I think I was just as qualified, if not more so, than the other folks who got in. So did you get in on affirmative action? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I know that there were kids who got in on affirmative action, and that is the affirmative action of legacy uh, admission. Uh, and I got in despite that disadvantage. Um, it's unfortunate that it's all like you earn your way, but because of affirmative action based on color, I and many other people would think you are there simply because you're black and not because you earn your way. Do you agree with me they need to get rid of affirmative action based on color? Absolutely not. I mean, affirmative action merely states that if you have two candidates that are equally qualified and one is black and the other is white, uh, that you should actually uh, ha have a preference for that black applicant in order to uh, take into account that in this society, uh, that black child more likely than not experience uh, greater hardship in, in demonstrating the same level of aptitude on those existing standardized tests. It also should be said that affirmative action, actually the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action when you look at the data are white women. Um, historically. That was and a so, uh, Indian guy I had on the show who pretended to be black and he got into a university because he knew had he been anything other than black, they would have discriminated against him and let a black person in based on color and not qualification. I mean, I wouldn't say that. I would say that it, at I'm saying that's like why Stanford he did it. Schools, uh, that's Indian, why he did Indian it. Indian students and, and Asian students are grossly overrepresented in, in these institutions as well. So I don't think that there is a problem of representation uh, on campuses uh, on the part of Indian Americans, although I could be wrong, and I'm, I'm happy to, to get more information yeah, on that. Yeah, talk to but Mindy Kaling's brother, and he'll tell you. I want to go quickly back to something, because there are a lot of folks who want to talk to you. Give me an example. Before the break, you said that blacks were brilliant and resilient. Give me an, one example first of them being brilliant and then resilient. Sure. I mean, I mean, look at the President of the United States uh, has done a number of things that have been brilliant strategically. Like what, uh, for example? Them. I mean, he killed Osama bin Laden. He passed um, health care reform, one of the largest uh, 
uh, expansions of the safety net in generations. And you think uh, that's that a going brilliant? To help a lot of people. You think that's a brilliant I think thing? It has, it has helped millions of people who never had health insurance get health insurance. I think there's room for improvement, like any policy. But without it, I mean, we'd be in a worse place. I think across the board, uh, a, a lot of folks know that. That's why the repeal movement failed. So is it brilliant because he's forcing the working class to pay for those who refuse to work and take care of themselves? Even though it's unconstitutional, too, you would call that brilliant? It's actually constitutional, according to the Supreme Court, twice. Uh, and they're the ones who interpret the Constitution. Well, the uh, Supreme Court will... also said that same-sex marriage was fine, too. And we so we know how they operate. I mean, the Supreme Court operates interpreting the Constitution. I think, you know, there will be disagreement on how it should be interpreted, as there should be. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, that is what the decision that has been made. Uh, I would also say that, you know, you said, you know, brilliant. Um, it has been it has been brilliant to see uh, young people across the country uh, become politically engaged, uh, politically mobilized. But we look at them. They're rowdy, angry, dangerous, dangerous, brainwashed black people who are out of control. They're morally bankrupt. We don't want those type of people rowdy. I mean, I think we need to have more people civically engaged. What we've or seen protesting. is people protests happening across the country, as happened in the civil rights movement. But you know what? The thugs, they are a bad example of the civil rights. The people in the civil rights movement, for the most part, were not thugs. Black Lives Matter and the Black Student Union and the uh, Communist Party members and others are thuggish people. And they are writing, writing and the, the, the destroying property and... Uh, unlike the Tea Party, remember when the Tea Party movement was there? They were polite, good people. I mean, what I saw with the Tea Party movement was a number of racist slogans that were uh, advanced people saying that Obama was uh, a number of racial slurs. I uh, was, was. But not you American, also see with was, the Black Lives Matter people, all of them are burning buildings, breaking into stores. Robbing, I mean, just rowdy, no good people. So, and I that's mean, that's know, the majority to of them. That, to say that, I mean, according to what statistics, is that the majority of them? Because we've seen hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, uh, that have joined the movement. Uh, and how many stores have you seen burned exactly? Uh, have you seen Baltimore lately or Missouri? Um, how many? If you could give me a count nationwide, how uh, many do you? One think is two minutes, my friend. Yes, but you said a majority of, of the hundreds of thousands of people. And so I, I would I would contend that if that were the case, uh, this would not just be a, a story in two places uh, with, a, with a handful of uh, potential stores, of which we don't know who actually set those on fire. Many folks were there. They're like robbing liquor actually, stores. No, but let me ask you this because we've got to come to a break, and then I want to come back to the phones. Your website, Campaign Zero, has a man with his hands up, uh, in a hand, hands up, don't shoot gesture. Uh, when I come back, I want to ask you about that, and I want you to give out your website for the folks, and we'll take some calls right after this break. Samu. Hey, Samu. Hello, how are you? Good, buddy. I want to know, <clears throat> your website, Campaign Zero, has a man with his hands up, and a hands up, don't shoot gesture. Um, do you guys know that that was a lie? Uh, I want to, do you, do you personally know that that was a lie, that that never happened? It was made up? So what I, what I do know is that, uh, investigators from, from the Justice No, give me a yes or first, uh, yes or no. Do you personally know that never happened? I mean, I was I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I know that... But I'm telling you, it was... A, ...have information on, on what may have been there and have interviewed a number of witnesses uh, have concluded otherwise in that particular case. Uh, that doesn't mean that the hands-up gesture uh, is not an appropriate symbol, certainly because if you look at a number of folks who have been killed by police, even in the past year, uh, who have had their hands up, you look at, for example, Jeremy Reed uh, in Bridgeton, New Jersey, uh, the video shows him getting out of his car with his hands up, and he's gunned down by a number of officers, black man. Uh, Gilbert Flores, same story. Let me ask uh, you, does Jerry it matter Bonner, to you story. that it was a lie? If it was a lie, wouldn't you want the lie to stop because you don't want to deceive people? 
I think it should stop when uh, black men stop getting killed by the police with their hands up, and that hasn't stopped yet. Let me ask, why do you, you black and white, your mother white, father black, why do you not accept your whiteness and promote that? Uh, I wouldn't say I don't accept my whiteness other than the fact that I understand as a uh, person of uh, mixed heritage in the United States that uh, I am labeled and considered black, and I and I am in solidarity with and and fight against the same forces of racial inequality uh, that all black folks face in this country. So do you do you like live the half white life, which means half is good and half is bad? The black part is bad. No, I don't think that there's anything bad about blackness or good about whiteness. Uh, I think it is an experience that, uh, in terms of being biracial, that you have access to folks who are white in a, in a different kind of a way, uh, and you understand sort of some of the ideologies and the, and the history uh, around those opinions. Um, well, let me just say this. understand we, how that side of the country uh, According to the what, department, what a department, According to the Department of Justice, there was no evidence that the hands up, don't shoot thing ever happened. It was all made up. I do want to ask this, and I'm going to the phones. Um, <clears throat> you agree with me that, you agree with me a person is innocent unless proven guilty, right? Yes, I do. And have, um, um, and you believe in justice, right? Absolutely. So have you guys gone back to repair the reputation and restore the livelihood of Joyce Zimmerman and Darren, Officer Darren Wilson, who acted in self-defense? Have you gone back to help those guys restore their lives? I don't think that they uh, acted in self First of all, I don't think they acted in self-defense. No, give me the yes uh, or no first. Have you gone back to help those no, guys? I have, I have not. Why not? not? Why not? Because, number one, uh, I haven't seen uh, strong evidence to suggest that they acted in, in self-defense, that they acted without bias, that, that, in, that, that those situations would have occurred in the same way had that been a white child instead of a black child. Does it matter that, that Joyce Zimmerman had a trial? Well, when you think about how the system works in the sense of who was on that uh, jury, what the composition of the jury was. So you have all uh, kind of excuses to justify was, your bad behavior. I mean, what did Trayvon Martin do that was bad behavior? He was walking home. With no, the I said so you I have, the same Sam, you have, same area. Sam, you, you have all types of excuses to justify <laughs> hating white people and cops. I don't hate white people or cops. Yes, what you I, do. What I, what I disagree with is uh, the violence and the impunity with which uh, though that white folks who are vigilantes as well as police officers uh, have been able to get away with in this country that is manifestly unjust and that is unsafe. For and you have people. no evidence uh, of that. Let me it. ask, are you a good yeah, I man? I do have evidence. So can we get into the evidence? Are you I'd a good man? Let me ask, are you a good man? I think people who know me would say yes. What do uh, you say? You, you mentioned... What do you say? Are you say a yes. good man? I would say yes. You believe uh, in God? I, you believe in God? I believe in a higher power, absolutely. How about God? Do you believe in God? Uh, I believe that, you know, God is, oftentimes when you say you believe in God, it can be interpreted in a number of ways. And so can uh, a higher power, too. A, uh, you can interpret right, what right. you mean by higher power, higher power. I want to know, do you I believe in God? Because... I've that noticed that when people say they believe in a higher power, they don't believe in anything. They're lying. So I want to know, do you I believe mean, in God? If you're meeting the, uh, the Christian interpretation of a God based in a, a literal interpretation of the Bible, I would say no. Let's go to, speaking of Bible, Bible, go to God out of Los Angeles. Bible, go to God, you're on with Samuel. Uh, you've already vetted him for me, Jesse. Thank you. Um, that was that was key right there because it is the godless, unlike it is the godless that are that are doing all this whining, complaining, and uh, you know, creating themselves into being victims. Um, sir, did you know that um, blacks kill blacks at five times the rate of anybody else? 
I'm familiar with the FBI statistics on violent crime. Absolutely. Is that a yes? Did you know that's true? Is that a yes? Uh, yes, according to the data that has been collected, I, I'm aware what? that that is, uh, is wrong. That that is black do, do you slaughter. accept that data, uh, Samuel? Uh, yeah, I think that those are uh, probably uh, there. There may be a there probably is a disproportion in terms of. Okay, so uh, he has a follow up question in, in the sense of how it's been defined. Go yeah. ahead, Bob. Go uh, so, what is wrong with black people that they've been turned into killing each other at such a high rate? more so than any other race. Exactly. So I think, number one, it's important to note that uh, even on the, over the course of this interview, uh, black, there has been a tendency to he label said, black people. No, he said what's violence. wrong with black people that they're doing it. Why are they doing it? Uh, I think that is a, a consequence of poverty. Uh, oh, and historical, Jesus. Uh, hold on, Samuel. I'm sorry I had to hang up. I mean, put you on hold. Hold on, Samuel. Thank you, Bob. I go to God. Grant, you're up next right after this break. Okay, folks, uh, final segment with Samuel uh, Sing Young Way with um, Campaign Zero. Samuel, you have a website you would like to give out? Absolutely. It's uh, joincampaignzero.org. It offers a range of solutions uh, to end police violence in this country. Well, I want to have you back. So many of the things I want, other things I'd like to ask, and I know there are some things you would like to say. Will you come back? Sure. Uh, Samuel, in, in three or four words, tell me what's good about you. What do you think is good about you? Uh, so I think I have a uh, analytical mind. I understand uh, data and how to make it presentable and accessible to people so they can understand the broader trend uh, of what's going on in society. And you think it's good to have an analytical mind? Absolutely. Uh, you think, that, you think that that made you a good man because you have an analytical mind? Uh, no, I think it is a talent. I don't think it makes you a good person. I think being a good person means that you uh, are able to honor your commitments to your family and friends. Uh, you're able to conduct yourself in the world in a way that is not um, harmful to others. Are you? So a, think, uh, uh, do you love all people? Absolutely. I love I love uh, the human race. I love uh, all people, and I think that there's a goodness in people. Uh, Do you love police officers? To, you love police officers? Yeah, I love all people. I think that they that people have been put into situations. No, I want to know, do you love white cops? I mean, I'll tell you that I love all people, right? No, no, no. And, Do but, you love but, white cops? I love them enough to, to want them to strive. Uh, no, give me a yes or no, a simple yes or no. Do you love white cops? Sure. Okay, let's go to Greg, Wilmington, Delaware. Go ahead, Greg. We were almost out of time, and I apologize. Yeah, real quick. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Samuel. Hey. Samuel, if you have an analytical mind, you've got to be one of the most dishonest people with a good mind I've ever ran into. Because if you think the Tea Party people are not nice, you have never been to a Tea Party event, and if you look at what's happening there and the, the peace and calm from which they present themselves and then what the place looks like after they leave compared to a Black Lives uh, Matters protest, you're either completely mad or do not have an analytical mind. Samuel? So what I'll say is that the response to the Tea Party rally by the police and the authorities is very different than the response to the Black Lives Matter rally. How the Black part, Lives Matter that, people are so rowdy and angry? Well, that is the assumption, but actually it is the police that in many ways escalated. You look at Baltimore I, yesterday. You know what, Sammy, I'm so sorry, buddy. I got to run. Sammy, I have you back. I'm sorry to cut you off. I have you back, okay?